My name is Elizabeth O'Neill. I'm the executive director of Chicago Booth Rothman London campus. It's my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's session, A System in Crisis, Can Democratic Capitalism Survive? As you can see, we have a full house here tonight, students, alumni, members of the community, other guests and colleagues. So you're all very welcome and we're so pleased you're here with us for what we believe will be an excellent event. This year, we are celebrating our 125th anniversary as a business school. That's 125 years of educational excellence, a commitment to rigorous inquiry and intellectual freedom, and a legacy of groundbreaking research and scholarship. And I hope that it did not go unnoticed as you walked into our lovely campus, uh, the testament to this all. Uh, you may have noticed the impressive gallery of Nobel laureates, 97 and still counting, I believe, of course, um, in the lobby, all associated with the University of Chicago. And four of those Nobel laureates are on faculty at Chicago Booth. For nearly 30 of our 125 years, we've had a physical presence in Europe, most of those here in London. And today on this campus, among other things, we run an executive MBA program. We offer executive education short courses, and we also offer this beautiful state-of-the-art facility as a conference center. The campus also serves as a regional hub for, our, hub for our alumni community, and we remain extremely grateful for their continuous support and engagement throughout the year. I would like to extend a special thanks tonight to one of our alums, Douglas Lowy, for his generous support of this evening's event. Across our global campuses in Chicago, Hong Kong, and London, Booth offers insights to help inform and perhaps even reframe our understanding of the world around us. Our MBA program, courses, and events provide our community with a forum to discuss the big ideas and emerging trends which are shaping the global landscape. And so tonight, as we celebrate 125 years of ideas, of innovation, of impact, it's my pleasure to welcome Professor Raghu Rajan from Chicago Booth and our special guest, Martin Wolf from the Financial Times. These are two individuals, I'm sure you will agree, who truly need no introduction, but just to give you a few highlights. Moderating this evening's session, Professor Rajan, who is the Catholic Dusak Miller Distinguished Service Professor of Finance at Chicago Booth, um, he's also the 23rd governor of the Reserve Bank of India and the former chief economist and director of research at the International Monetary Fund. And we're delighted that Professor Rajan is with us on the London campus as our faculty in residence at the moment. And our guest, of course, Martin Wolf, is the chief economics commentator at the Financial Times. He was awarded the CBE, that is the commander of the British Empire in 2000 for his services to financial journalism and he was a member of the UK's Independent Commission on Banking in 2010 and 11. Mr. Wolf has numerous other accolades for his journalism and economic commentary. And just to note a couple here, he won the Overseas Press Club of America's Prize for Best Commentary on International News in Any Medium in 2013, and the 2019 Lifetime Achievement Award at the Gerald Loeb Awards. So tonight's theme, as you all know, will share and or will explore the key themes from Mr. Wolf's most recent publication, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. So with that, it's my pleasure to hand it over to Professor Rajan to kick off this evening's fireside chat. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, and thanks everyone for coming here. Thank you, Martin. Uh, when I uh, thought about somebody I would like to talk to in front of this audience, I, looked, I, I was thinking through all the people I knew uh, who would uh, um, match, overmatch the intellectual uh, caliber of the audience that comes to Chicago events. And uh, I could think of no, nobody better than Martin. And I asked him, and he said, sure. Uh, so glad that you could make it. And uh, you know, let's let's get to uh, the heart of the book very uh, very quickly. W why did you write this book? So first, before I answer that question, I have to say it's a great pleasure to be here with you, um, and I feel very particularly honoured since I have nothing to do with the University of Chicago. I went entirely to Oxford, uh, <laughs> um, a much older, possibly less distinguished university. But the um, 
so there, there's a personal reason and a professional reason, and I start the book with the personal reason, um, which is important, though I wrote the preface after I wrote the rest. Um, so I suspect may be in different ways true of many people here. Uh, I was the child, I'm the child of refugees. Um, my um, parents came either in the, my father's case immediately before the Second World War from Vienna. Um, he left in 1937, seeing what was going to happen. And my mother escaped really with the skin of her teeth um, in May 1940 from the Netherlands with her father, mother, and immediate um, siblings. Um, and they were fleeing Hitler because they were Jews. And, uh, and uh, they both had large families, very large extended families. Every single member of the room was killed. So I've always been aware of this as a background to my life. And I took away from it one very simple lesson that civilized life orderly life, a stable life, even what had hoped to be in the 1920s in Germany, democratic life, could collapse completely in catastrophe. And, and I don't make any further parallels with our time, except that fundamental sense, which I think many people in this country and many people in America particularly don't share, of how insecure stability is. So that's the emotional reason. The, the, the immediate cause is that it became obvious to me in 2016 that something very big was going on uh, in different ways, but there were common themes I felt um, in uh, Britain with the Brexit vote, which was clearly a rejection of our establishment and our, by uh, a populist movement, an important populist movement. And of course, with the emergence as the standard bearer for uh, the Republicans, which I'd always seen as a party of the free market and uh, stable constitutionalism, uh, the emergence of Donald Trump, who doesn't seem to me, didn't seem to me to represent either. And uh, with a huge number of supporters. So I wanted to understand why this was happening and what it might mean. And that then led me to what turned out to be, I didn't know this, a vast literature in which particularly Larry Diamond of Stanford was a major figure on the democratic recession, and uh, which he dated to 2005, roughly. And uh, you can see very clearly traced out in the political histories of many countries, um, mostly newly emerging or, emerging or developing countries, um, where there was very clear backsliding towards autocracy on multiple dimensions. And the list of these countries now is, of course, very, very long. And, uh, and you can also see in World Value Service uh, very clear signs in many countries, notably including advanced democracies, what political scientists refer to as consolidated democracies, of a pretty strong skepticism about democracy as a system, about the way it was working for them, some desire quite clearly expressed, even in Britain and America, for a strong leader who would sort out all this nonsense that they saw around them out. Um, so I began to feel something very big is going on, and I should try and analyze what's going on. And that forced me to go back and ask myself, well, what is the relationship between the market economy and democracy. When do they support each other? And when do you, does it create crisis? How relevant is that to where we are now? And that then led me on to the question of what is populism? When is it a good thing? When is it a bad thing? And that led me over many years, it was quite a struggle to this book, which tried to put together my views as they emerged um, on what was going on and what it might mean. But I came away from it at the end, and I think events during this period, if anything more alarmed than when I started. Um, and the most noticeable reason for that, and I make something of that in the beginning, is of course what is, um, to my mind, unambiguously a coup attempt by the American president against the American electoral process, which is, simply cannot be exaggerated in terms of its significance politically, historically, and globally. It's interesting. I mean, you're. Uh, 
basically we don't think about how fragile the institutions we we live under are, right? That if you look at history, they go backwards and forwards. That it's not a it's not a permanent thing, and they have to be renewed uh, all the time. And and you have every to fight generation for has to renew the the institutions uh, in their own way. Otherwise, they become more about. Absolutely. So, what what leads to Donald Trump? What what are the forces that produce a Donald Trump? I mean, you talk about demagogic authoritarian capitalism. I presume that's one example. Yes, he's a demagogue. I don't think anybody can. Do, he's a classic demagogue. Uh, you know, in the history of Western thinking about demagoguery, uh, uh, I went back to all this. Um, because a long time before I became a sort of economist, so it's obviously debatable what sort of an economist I am, but long before that I was a classicist. So I spent years and years reading Latin and Greek, which is the best part of my education. All the rest is quite trivial. I, I mean that with absolute seriousness. I'm not joking. Uh, it might be seen as a joke. but I, So I went back to Thucydides and Cleon, the, the, the discussion of the, uh, his role in the Peloponnesian War, before that, to Plato, who discusses in great detail how demagogues manipulate democracy, uh, and also to Aristotle, who discuss how a democracy can work. And uh, what I uh, took from that, and particularly from the Aristotle analysis in politics, which I think is an old wisdom, is that if you want a stable democratic polity, you need a very strong middle class. That was basically what he said. That is to say, independent people who know they're not strong enough to survive on their own, who know they're not strong enough to manipulate the state for their advantage, in which case it doesn't matter really who rules it, and they know they're not so weak that they can only survive by virtue of their a clientelist relation with patrons. They have an independent role, an independent life, and they need institutions and trustworthy institutions to sustain their existence. And uh, one of the important facts about Athens, which had innumerable thoughts, it's obviously not in our sense, a democracy with slaves and no role for women and so forth. Nonetheless, it was a, a quite an advanced commercial state and it is a, a pretty large middle class until they killed themselves in the Peloponnesian War. I won't go into that further. But the main point is that uh, I came to the view that the big story is a progressive hollowing out of the middle class. And that was partly, I think, to do with very powerful underlying economic forces and partly because of policy choices, which in all truth, I didn't really understand fully myself. So it, uh, I, I've, I've changed my mind on some important things. And what happens when the middle class starts getting hollowed out is people start looking for saviors. They desperately fear falling through into the bottom among the despised poor. They feel that they probably can't cling on to the status they had before. And I, my argument is that was quite particularly true in both York, in both uh, in most Western countries, France, Britain, America, Italy, because of what's happened to the industrial working class which is a central part of our post-war middle class. And they then, they didn't like the leftish alternative because one, nobody really believed in socialism anymore. And two, they really didn't like the dominant force in the, the left, which I refer to, as you know, as the Brahmins, following Piketty, the only way in any sense in which I do follow Piketty. So they wanted a, uh, a demagogue who would appeal to them culturally. But he couldn't be, but they also definitely didn't want traditional right wing free market conservatism because they saw them as a lot of stuffed shirts who were utterly uninterested in them. So they went for a, a, a populist demagogue, as they have done many, many times before in many different ways in the 20s and 30s all over the world now. I don't need to list all the countries. And Trump was a particularly remarkably brilliant one and he remains simply brilliant one um the upside of trump as an individual is he doesn't have a, a real program uh, uh much better than he's having a real program uh some of the people around him do that worries me a lot 
really worries me a lot about another term. The downside is he represents in all the other respect, the worst forms of demagoguery in terms of self-seeking, corruption, uh, corruption of institutions, uh, and and so forth, and uh, therefore is a very powerful destabilizing force. But I understand fully why the people who support him support him because of the, he is the sort of leader they want to bash their enemies. I just had a clip in my, uh, which I didn't know, but it's a wonderful clip in my, in my po podcast series on this, in which Clark Trump talks to a huge audience, this is quite recent, and he says at the end, with enormous applause, I am your retribution. And that is absolutely classic of this form of politics. So um, you said in the demise of the middle class, uh, Mistakes were made, uh, things that you've changed your mind on. What, what are you What are you talking about there? Well, uh, so um, I basically think, uh, oh, we uh, um, we liberalised our economies in the West quite radically. Um, of course, the welfare state largely survived, though it was hollowed out in some important ways. Um, and it's pretty clear to me, I'll leave aside complex questions about uh, the nature of inequality and so forth, but what's pretty clear to me is there were a lot of very big winners from this process, but there were also some pretty big losers. And people who were interested as I was and very pro-free trade knew that technically, theoretically, but the truth is, we didn't think it was very important to do anything about it. We thought the market would just sort it out. Uh, good Chicago principle, I would have thought. But what we ended up doing in a lot of important places is we created places that imploded. It wasn't just factories that imploded. So if you look at Britain, take the, the British case, um, the deindustrialization of Britain in the 1880s and 90s, 1980s and 80s, was very dramatic, uh, the most severe, as far as I can see, in any large country. And our industrial society, what, what disappeared, was profoundly regionally concentrated. There were towns, big towns. Sheffield had the steel, steel industry. There were pottery towns. There were, before that, there had been textile towns. They all collapsed and creating a tremendous trauma. The collapse of the coal mining industry was equally significant in the British case. And I think a lot of that was probably inevitable. But the, the question is, did we make any effort to do anything about this? And the answer quite clearly, and I believe, though I don't know the American story as well, but in states like Pennsylvania, Ohio, and so forth, similar things happened. And for people just to remember, these are people without university degrees. They didn't have the sorts of skills that the new economy, which I talk about a lot, was demanding. There were lots of new jobs for graduates, people who could, and we created a whole new class of technically skilled people who got, went into these jobs. These people weren't going to be turned into that. Basically, they were left to work maybe in warehouses of Amazon and things like things which were quite demeaning. They felt that they were discarded and it is i'm afraid which you can't ignore it very important that so many of them were men right and and they were i've referred to them in my book as the dry tinder for for somebody to come along and like the spark and we should have expected then i argue and i'll just add this a bit i feel that crucially expecting 2016 a crucial moment was what happened in the financial crisis because there were Two things about a huge financial crisis, which are completely obvious. First, it shows that the people in charge haven't got a clue. You really can't look at a, a financial crisis of the scale we went through and not conclude that all these immensely brilliant technocrats, central bankers, regulators, bankers, and all that didn't have a clue. And secondly, when it came to them, 
there was no limit to how much resources would be poured into them. While, of course, we all know what happened to many people losing their houses and so forth. That quite understandably made people very, very angry since for the reasons I suggest, they had long since lost confidence in the left. That left we, uh, what they needed is a really brilliant right-wing populist. Now, the funny thing, which is where domestic society, I've become pretty convinced, you know, each country has its own story. So our populist was Boris Johnson. And America's populist, populist was Donald Trump. I prefer Boris Johnson. But the... But the they were both playing the same tune. It's just the personality that worked was different. In France, it'll be Marine Le Pen. It is widely believed by the French people I know, a lot of people, that she's likely to be the next president. I have no idea what that will mean, but we know what the roots of her party are and what she came from. Uh, uh, in Italy, they actually do have an erstwhile fascist, supposedly as prime minister. She seems to be behaving very well so far. We'll see how that goes. But yes, people want an outsider. And the a final point I would make, and this again I didn't really understand. It's so obvious, however, that looking back, when people are really frightened and angry, they don't feel secure, they go tribal. And nationalism is the core tribal project. It is inevitably, therefore, inevitable that a, tri a nationalist leader will come forward. That's what happened in the interwar years. Again, I'm not making any direct comparison. And it's what you can see in Turkey. In You saw recently until just now in Brazil. And if I may say so, you even see it in India. What do the elites still not get about Donald Trump or Boris Johnson? Or have they realized what these politicians are appealing to and do they have an alternative? Well, in Britain, at the moment, I believe it's temporary, but I will be interested to see what you might call orthodox conservatism has taken over and the elites in charge have essentially decided I'm being crude about it, to go on as if nothing happened. I mean, obviously something has happened and hope for the best. I think that's a project that will fail and it will come back. I don't know how it will come back, but I suspect if we continue on our present path, at some point in the next 10 years, we will get a much more serious nationalist politician than we've had so far uh, because it's not working. America's a very different story because the economy in aggregate is working. Um, uh, I think, to me, what the elites in America don't understand, um, and that's part of my book, it's where my book ends, is they're playing with fire. Uh, that by buying into and supporting directly or indirectly a party that will be headed, I think, by this man, they are not creating a regime which will make, in the long run, the lives of themselves and people like themselves safer. safer. And I discuss that in my book. But uh, I think they have formed a, a implicit bargain, which I call, um, I use this phrase first, and I think I'm the first person, but I've not, because I've not found anyone who used, in 2006, Pluto populism or plutocratic populism. And sometimes I try to explain it by as, the real meaning of the Southern strategy, how, how the South worked. Um, but basically they've decided if we can get enough angry people to buy into a nationalist and culturally reactionary project to vote us into power, we'll get the what, two things we really, really want. Almost no taxes and almost no regulation. That's the deal. And... I think that's a very, very dangerous deal. Um, by the way, it is why the German bourgeoisie and aristocracy chose Hitler when he got to, and they thought they could manage him. Again, I'm not making direct comparisons. So I think that's the deal. And I think it's a very dangerous deal because they're playing with a, uh, a system of power that history strongly suggests they can't ultimately contain.
once you get somebody like this who really knows what he's doing, and the best example I believe in the world right now in sort of major significant countries is Erdogan, um, he will destroy the plutocracy or make them his slaves. And uh, I don't think the Americans understand that. Uh, maybe they're right not to understand it, but that's the deal. And uh, I wish they would stop it. Yeah. I mean, you keep saying, uh, I'm, I don't want to make a direct comparison. Yeah, but, but you're implicitly, I mean, you're saying, yes, that might be stretched right now, but it may be rea reality sooner than we think. And I that's, think the form of, I discussed this, the form of fascism we saw in the interwar period came out of very special circumstances with very special forms of social organization. And in particular, and this is something I, I've been struggling with and I still don't fully understand, the, the move from a party-based, militaristic party-based structure of political organization, which was very much the structure of that time, to the more anarchic, social media-driven political structures of today is, I suspect, very profound. And therefore, what happened with European fascism, particularly Italy and Germany, was the construction of a private army, which was both a political army and a, an army army, you know, the brown shirts. And the, there is nothing like that yet. However, of course, if you wanted to organize something like that in the most heavily armed country on earth, you know where you'd start. Yeah. Well, we have some examples already of small yeah, military. Relatively groups. small. If small. you get, if after Trump drops dead, his successor is somebody who wants to create a private army, and uh, then I would suspect that in America, uh, if he controlled the... Um, the main machinery of the state, they have a pretty good chance of doing it. Right. So before I move to, to another issue you talk about, let me just, you mentioned a few leaders, a few countries in the, in the emerging uh, markets, which have this kind of, wh what's going on there? Is it a similar kind of populism? Is this, who, who's the angered uh, who, who's the angered lot there? Who... I think there is actually, so uh, all unhappy countries are unhappy in their own way. So uh, I've spent a lot enough time wandering around the world, talking to people, reading it, to realize that every country has its own story. And so all generalizations are dangerous. Uh, but I think there are some con common elements. Usually, there is an important class of people, very big, who feel they have not been listened to, they feel they've been ignored, and they feel they're, they are looked down upon by the social and intellectual elites of their country. Uh, I think that's very obvious. It was very obvious in Poland. It's very obvious in Turkey. I would suggest it's quite obvious in India. It certainly was obvious in Brazil. And... They want someone, to, they don't expect anything of government. The second thing is they don't really believe government works. So why, why get invested in all the, and they often have reason for that because it hasn't. And I could go through many of these countries, not all. Poland is a more, because Poland did. Um, but they feel it hasn't worked for them. And I think there are enough people in all these societies who can, even when they've done in aggregate quite well, who would feel that, well, what has this meant for us? Look at the unemployment rates in India, for example, the, the job opportunities available to many, not very satisfactory. In Turkey, it was very much the secular elite versus the Anatolian peasantry, who were much more traditional, more conservative. Social change reinforces that. So I think there's usually a large number of people who feel dissatisfied and unhappy, don't trust government, think that their traditional values are being trampled on, but because, partly because of social and economic change, and they feel nobody speaks to them, and their cause is often, again, quite understandably, some sort of mixture of religious and national 
anxieties and anger, and they want a leader who will articulate that for them. And I feel that if you go through the people um, who are involved in this, Kaczynski, or I mentioned a number of others, go to many others, they are good at that. And it is a way of mobilizing people, and it's what Thucydides describes in his discussion of the Peloponnesian War. It's really not that new. We know, we've known for two and a half thousand years that that's how democracies fail, because if you don't convince um, the majority that the system works for them, they'll break the system. Absolutely. So let's move to the other big threat you talk about. So this was the uh, demagogic authoritarian capitalism, the internal threat. Yeah. The external threat you talk about is bureaucratic authoritarian capitalism. I presume you mean China. But I mean China. Okay. I do say China. I think one could say, but I don't want to get into that too much, that Vietnam falls into the same category, the same very small category. Just happens to contain the biggest, well, not yet, not anymore the biggest country in the world by population, but never mind. Big enough. So tell us more about that. Why is it an external threat? And uh, what what should the West do? Well, I, let's leave aside the external threat for the moment. Uh, I think we have to recognize that China has created something new in important ways and extraordinary, you know, a sort of communist capitalism. I think it's a very delicate and uh, fragile compromise too. And I have a, now written many columns in going back almost 10 years in which I argue that the Xi Jinping project has a very good chance of failing in its own terms. Uh, uh, because what he's trying to do is reimpose order because he felt and feels rightly, I think, that in the context of China, the immense economic success of the market experiment brought with it absolutely inevitably a, a rampant and colossal corruption of the bureaucratic structure because you're trying to operate capitalism without law. And that Darren Achimolio has got some very good stuff on that. That's pretty difficult to do, and it's corrosive. So what he's tried to do in response is to not to change that, because he can't have the law overriding the Communist Party. What he's tried to do is create a greater discipline in the Communist Party and in the hierarchy by punishing a lot of people and frightening them. And, of course, that's paralyzed the system. So he's he's got a really big problem. Nonetheless... There's China with a, this strongly reinforced bureaucratic system, which, which is quite defensive about that, doesn't want to get any nasty ideas floating around in China, at the same time as China is, of course, deeply involved in the rest of the world. That's a pretty fragile structure. And one of the things China will want to do is insulate itself as far as possible and insulate its people as far as possible from unwelcome ideas from outside. And naturally and automatically, that means they find themselves interfering in what we do. Not much yet, but in countries that are weaker, particularly countries closer to them, the inter interference becomes quite obvious. Now, how far this is a threat I don't share the American view now. America is a very Manichaean culture. And basically, you're either a friend or you're an immortal enemy. I th but I think we have to recognize that China is, is, is an important great power, which I believe we can work with and have to work with. But there are some really quite important points on which we clash as a matter of values and as a matter of interests. There are things we want in terms of the independence of its neighbors, in terms of uh, our own independence, uh, which China will be trying to constrain. So I think we need to be watchful about this. But my own view, by the way, I know this is, would be seen as, uh, you know, if I look at the threats to my civilization right now, if I compare it with the erosion of democracy from within to the, the threat to democracy from without, I'm more concerned about the former than the latter. 
I don't ultimately. I believe that it is possible. Maybe I'm naive to to, to work out a, a modus vivendi with China, and I don't believe that its ideology, as opposed to its wealth and power, is an enormous attraction to most people around the world. It's rather different even from the Soviet Union in that respect. I remember in my childhood, there were lots and lots and lots of communists. There aren't lots and lots of Chinese communists around. So I'm reasonably relaxed about China, and I've made this clear in a lot of my columns, and most people I know in Washington think I'm a lunatic. So we, we will part company, I will part company with them on this, but I believe I'm correct. Well, you have an agenda on how to bring the two countries together in your book, uh, the deepen integration, focus on common tasks and carrots and sticks, which I think uh, people should read if they get the chance. Uh, but let me turn to solutions that you're talking about. Uh, I mean, you, you talk about, I think, four words, which I think are very important, security, opportunity, prosperity, and dignity. And you think those will be key to, to uh, creating better conditions in the industrial world. Um, you know, care to talk quickly about those? Why those four? I think, first of all, I think, I mean, the best criticism of my, my book is, I think, my own best criticism of my book is that I'm much better on the analysis of the problems and the solutions, which worries the hell for, about of me. But I haven't read, having read lots of other people, I don't think they're in better shape either. The, the, and at least I don't pretend. So the answer is, I, d I make it very clear that in general, with a few exceptions, I don't believe there are transformative solutions because what we are seeing is partly, and it may get much worse uh, uh, with this AI revolution, which I don't really discuss, um, that the economy is not helping. But to put it bluntly, a lot of what we are seeing is the reversal of the mass industrialization, which did so much, I argue in my book, to create mass suffrage democracy. And the that is reversing for very, very powerful reasons. And it is in the process also tending to generate a new plutocracy of extraordinary wealth and power Who's who's uh, who own um, um, the the great transformative companies of our time, which have some very peculiar characteristics, and one of the most important is they generate essentially no employment. So Larry Summers, I repeat this in my book, has this. I got it from him originally, but he basically. Oh. Uh, encourage me to look at the employment generated by General Motors with the employment generated by the most valuable company in the day, in the US, Apple. And the, the difference is uh, approximately relative to population, 20 to 1. Yeah. Though, right? though Amazon is a little better. Right? Amazon is better, but a, a lot of the jobs not are jobs. not great jobs. No. Uh, GM created an incredibly, and all the rest of powerful middle class. Uh, Apple can't do that. So that's just big. So we are working upstream. I think that uh, the models I think we have to start looking at, which will be already regarded as absolutely intolerable, but I think the sort of the, the Danish idea of flex security is a very powerful one. If you can persuade people to pay the taxes, I think they should pay the taxes. I think everybody in this room should pay more tax than you do, includes me. Uh, uh, I'm sure you disagree, but that happens to be my view. The, the, that's an important part. Uh, that's part of the politics. Uh, but it has to be spent well, which means you have to have an effective credible government system and that is of course something i discuss at length how you how you might go uh, uh, about that i think we do have i mean i don't agree with the full gamut at all of what biden's you know the new form of industrial policy is but i think we have to look again and uh, achimolu and Ro and johnson's new book is very important in looking at uh, um what you can do sensibly to shift and exploit new technologies in a way that benefit more people directly. I think it's a pretty obvious big question, like who owns data? 
Who owns the data? Who 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 pays for that? Why does Zuckerberg get to actually? You know, I don't use his damn program. But anyway, the so there there are um, questions about taxation, which you might well uh, be um, coming to. I emphasize competition policy, which I think is a very big issue in because we've created some pretty powerful monopolies, and I think they're going about to get worse. Uh, and that is a concentration of political and economic power in private hands I don't find acceptable. Um, and uh, we're going to have to invest a lot in uh, in regional regeneration, uh, and so that means infrastructure and all the rest of it, even if it's not immediately profitable, because we can't just abandon huge chunks of our population, and they can't all move to London because they can't afford a house. And the same, I think, applies even the way. So I could go through these things. Now, is this a completely convincing package which will solve this problem? No. But I think these are the sorts of areas that governments in societies should be looking at if they start believing that they, they, can, they, they can do something, they have to do something else than just exploit all this anger and rage or pretend it doesn't exist, which is where I think we've been. Yeah. I mean, one one support for these place-based policies is technology. Now that you can work at a distance, you can have more people earning incomes there. I think it fits very sure. well with the theme of your last book, and I mentioned that. Uh, and uh, I think it's something that many of us, uh, you know, I assume 30 years ago that mobility will be easier to manage than it has yes. been. And I think now it's obvious that we've created massive obstacles to it of many different kinds. And in any case, getting enormous numbers of people to move. You know, I have a friend, who, I won't mention his name, who happened to work in the Treasury for a while. And his basic theory is you can never save any of these places. Everybody needs to move to London. Well, I can promise you that's not a governing program in Britain. <laughs> and I don't think everybody can move to New York either. Of course. Or Florida. God now, I, um, well, one word, just uh, dignity. What do you mean by dignity? And yes, that's important. Uh, the, uh, well, I think that has two dimensions. And some, some, some dimension, this is very uh, difficult. So the, one is dignity in work, that there is, uh, that there is, security, some basic security, that there you can earn an income either through, perhaps partly through wage subsidies or minimum wages, which would work much better than I thought, which can have a reasonable chance of supporting a family. Um, that's part of dignity. Uh, Gene Sperling's book, I think, is very, very good on this. And I respect him and I respect uh, it. But the other side of it is cultural. It is obvious and, and right that we are going through massive cultural upheavals and have been for but many of these cultural upheavals are necessary and desirable. It is not necessary and desirable. In, in fact, I think it's profoundly counterproductive to pour vast scorn on people who, by virtue of their own cultural background, life experience, and simply by virtue of their age, just aren't with this program. Because if you do, if you pour scorn and treat uh, the non-university educated, older working class people as, to quote a, a famous politician, deplorables, they're going to behave deplorably, uh, quote unquote. And you know what they did. So part of dignity is accepting, and this is a very important part of my book, and I don't think I get it, that citizens are all part of one thing and they deserve respect in the political process. In, and if you don't give them that, they will take their revenge. And so what I say in my book is if once you get into a, and I don't want to go into all the details, into a, a certain very aggressive um, minority identity politics, you will end up for sure with majority identity politics. And we know what that looks like. So we have to be careful about this. So the, the big theme of my book in this respect 
is to try and think about policy and approaches that so far as possible are inclusive rather than exclusive, that don't emphasize differences, but reduce them. And I actually genuinely think on the whole, with all the mistakes and problems, Biden gets that, which is one of the reasons I rather like him. Um, I don't want to talk about your tax proposals. We don't have as much time. You just wrote about uh, the land tax in one of your columns. Yes, yes I'm so, very keen on land taxes. So, so let's, I'm let's, a Henry George's. Henry George's uh, uh, view on, on the rents land. associated with land, which yeah. you, you think are fair game. But uh, let me talk about two um, uh, ideas you put out, the House of Merit and House of the People. Can you talk a little bit okay, more well, about that? The, the former is really just a, in, in the British context. When you start dealing political reforms, which is something I probably shouldn't have done, but it was fun, uh, uh, you end up inevitably talking about the specific national context. Uh, so we have a House of Lords, and there are two things we can do. I argue there is an argument for having such an institution, provided it, ha it can't veto the proposals of the House of Commons. But it, if it has a very distinguished, independent group of people who can revise legislation, address problems in legislation, which in all truth our members of parliament are not competent to do, that has merit. Actually, I think that in the British case, and I followed this fairly closely. I should admit I'm rather biased because my wife is a crossbench peer. Uh, um, poor thing. Uh, the, but the point is, as an, as an advisory chamber, the Canadians have a Senate which basically performs a similar function. And interestingly, your, the American Senate was originally designed in part to be that. I won't go into that in greater detail. But that... Uh, this is a quite valuable part of the institutional architecture, but it cannot work in the British case um, without a comprehensive reform of how it's selected, which is at the moment a joke and a catastrophe. But I think the Starmer, Mr. Starmer is likely to want to abolish it and replace it with something else, another elected chamber, and I think that will probably make it worse. My more radical suggestion uh, which I followed up when the column I wrote a week ago, is, uh, and it's, I've discovered to my surprise, a lot of people interested in this, to introduce into politics what was essentially a core part of the Athenian, con I'm not replacing representative democracy, but, uh, and I'm, this links with our, I don't discuss this so fully, the possibility of going to the Swiss approach on referendums. If you're going to do referendums, you have to do it the way the Swiss do. Uh, uh, certainly not the way we've done it. Um, the, but I'll leave that aside. I came to the view that there's a lot of evidence that assemblies, either ad hoc or possibly perm permanent, but let's focus on ad hoc, of people selected by law, ordinary people who are asked to review and analyze important policy issues. Uh, and the most, one of the most famous cases in Europe was abortion in Ireland, which I discussed, um, are able or have been able in some important cases to reach consensus, close, not perfect, clear, but a formed consensus, which forms the basis of uh, educating the wider public if there should be a referendum or even in the political process. And I feel there are sufficient problems, deep problems, which I discussed in those columns and a little in this, with the representative democratic system as now manipulated with social media and all the rest of it, that considering the possibility of introducing the lot, the principle of selection of ordinary people by lot directly into the political process is something we should now consider because the current political systems we have with the extraordinarily deep manipulation of public opinion by uh, pollsters and so forth is really, to my mind, quite problematic. So it's, those were the ideas I float. And I would like to just start a discussion of whether if we're going to have a democracies, uh, what, are, what role might there be within independent 
in fully independent voices of different kinds alongside the purely representative election, which, as we can see, can be subverted. So uh, I want to give some time to the audience to ask questions. You, you see, we could keep going on. We haven't even touched on Chat, chat GPT Plus, which was uh, which came after your book was written. But uh, maybe some of you would uh, would raise the questions you want to. Uh, gentleman back there in the green shirt. Uh, Thank you both for a, a great discussion. I guess uh, on the same point you just mentioned, uh, you talked about uh, the industrialization of uh, massive towns like Sheffield and other places which saw modernization. What do you think is the impact of AI on other towns now? Are we living in the same age? Will it be much faster? And how does government actually get this in control? And your name, please? I'm Ashwin, and thank you. So the, my, I've written one column on this. Um, look, I would imagine everyone in this audience probably has better informed views on the implications of AI than I have. Uh, I, I claim no expertise whatsoever in this. And uh, so that's absolutely crucial. I sort of feel, though, that I'm not hopeless in this regard, because when I read what the experts say in their letters, you know, Musk got a let produced letter, they sound pretty gormless to me, too. Not that they don't understand the technology, they may or may not, but the truth is, it's very, very hard to work out the full implications of a new technology on society. Uh, I can safely say that in the discussion in the 90s, which I followed very carefully on the emergence of the internet, there, was, there were very few, there were one or two, but very few people who got to realize how it was really going to work. Um, so I'm sure that's true here. But something that, there seemed to me uh, at least two aspects of it which are central must be central. Um, uh, uh, the first is the power of the technology to create essentially limitless and perfect fakery. That's pretty worrying, okay? Um, fake videos, fake photos, fake stories. Uh, and, uh, I mean, that could be the coup de grace for everything, because if you... Our any advanced society, including the quite, depends on trust. Without it, you can't check everybody, everything. And so this is really pretty scary to me. The second thing, of course, is that it may, and this is less clear, they talk about productivity, lead to a massive dislocation of jobs, predominantly for white collar people. So we add to and there are lots of other, we add to the blue collar may mayhem, a white collar mayhem. And meanwhile, the people who own the firms that do this will convert from being worth 100 billion or 200 billion to trillions. Um, and that's just completely explosive. Uh, so those are two worries I have right now. Uh, then the question will be, what do you think should be done about it? And my answer to this was in my column, was I don't know what should be done about it. My own view is it should all be closed down, all, every last bit of it. But, but of course, we're not going to do anything about it. Let's be clear. We are not going to do anything about it. It's just going to happen to us, as happened with its uh, forebears, uh, uh, the social media, you know, which are as remain. The Chinese government will do something about it. That I am sure. And we probably won't like the results. But they are not going to let this run amok. We will. And so we just have to pray it works out. Lady up here. Hello. I'm Sophia Matveva. And I did political science at the University of Chicago. And then I came back for my MBA at Chicago Booth. And I'm a big fan of yours, Martin. And you're talking so passionately about democracy, but 
is it a universally good thing? So are there, you know, are there perhaps some examples of where democracy is not the best system? Is there maybe, for example, an education limit or an income limit? Essentially, what are your views on is democracy universally? I have a, I symbolize, I have a chapter which has a very extended discussion of what is called epistocracy. As I'm sure you know, this, of course, is Greek. And the greatest, the most important epistocrat in the Western tradition was, of course, Plato. So he's very old. And he thought, and this is my best, I would, could go on forever because there are so many points to make about this. But he thought the obvious solution, and it fitted very well with what I understand to be the Chinese philosophical tradition, which is the solution to the problem would be to have a cadre of guardians. And the characters of the guardians, in his view, would be they couldn't have families because that's corrupting. You must never favor your children. They must be educated completely independently from the rest of society, and they must be completely disinterested. And he tried to pursue this uh, program, as, of course, the Chinese have over the time, and mostly it hasn't worked very well, because pretty soon, if you give unaccountable power, with, there's nobody to account to except the monarch, who is generally rather sleepy, to a bunch of people who are informed that they are all wise and all uh, rational, they pretty soon become corrupt monsters. Uh, now, there are, that isn't always true, um, but the, the institution we created that was closest to that was the Roman Catholic Church. And I would suggest a close history of the higher echelons of the Catholic Church in the late Middle Ages would be beneficial to people who think that solves this problem. So my view is that, um, and at the final point I would make, and this is very important, I don't think self-interestedness, um, which is the main complaint, you know, people don't understand. I think the problem with the elites that you would favor is that they are more rationally and ruthlessly self-interested than ordinary people. And, uh, and I don't want to be ruled by all-powerful epistocrats who are rationally and ruthlessly self-interested. We have enough of that already. So I trust ordinary people. Uh, but I discuss this uh, length in my book. There's some very interesting American writers in that tradition. Um, uh, perhaps one final point. I don't know it's going too long, because. but the, the really big problem, which we did find in the 19th century, I mean, I've just thought the theoretical point. We constantly, in many countries, decided to, to change the threshold for the vote over time to include... Uh, to, you know, as education develop, educational levels and uh, property levels. And of course, uh, every new line was palpably arbitrary. It couldn't but be, you know, A is just on one side and B is just on the other side. So once you're opening it up in this way, what happened everywhere is the people who were just on the other side said, what about me? Why is this person that favored over me? There was no good answer. So actually, once you start the process of giving anybody outside the narrow circle of, uh, of the aristocracy in our society a political voice, it starts log rolling very, very quickly to pretty well everybody. And the last group of people in our society to get the vote, by the way, were women. On that note, uh, uh, Frankly, I, th way. I think what, uh, what Martin gi has given us is many important reasons to read the book carefully. <laughs> and, and I hope many of you will. And uh, of course, you will continue following his columns in the Financial Times. Let me, uh, I know Elizabeth wants to come back and, uh, and say something, but let me say we all uh, oh, Martin, a big hand. So just adding my thanks, Martin, to you and Professor Rajan for this uh, fantastic discussion this evening.
Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us here in the audience. Before we head upstairs to the first floor to the networking reception, I'd like to mention two additional upcoming events here on campus. So Thursday night this week, you are all invited to join us where the alumni community will be hosting a discussion on Asian capital in the European real estate uh, market. So please join us for that. Or virtually on the 14th of June, there is a session on shareholder democracy, which is um, part of our unpicking or unpacking ESG series co-hosted by the Stigler Center and the Rastandi Center um, and in partnership, in fact, with the Financial Times. So you're all very welcome to, uh, we'll, in a follow up to this event, we'll share information on how to access that event. The recording for this event itself will be featured as a podcast on Chicago Booth Review podcast series, which is new. You all have a card on your seat, which shows you how to access that podcast. So we do welcome um, you to check that out as well. Um, and then finally, just thank you again. We hope the conversation continues upstairs and we look forward to sharing a, a glass of wine um, or a, your beverage of choice um, and a little bit of nibbles uh, upstairs. So thank you all once again, and thank you. Martin.